Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Langer and I am here today in London at Regents University with Sheriona Menzam and she has an upcoming book called Breath of Life, an introduction to cranial biodynamics, craniosacral biodynamics. She's also an amazing teacher and she specializes in oxytocin and bonding and she's a dance therapist and a prenatal and birth expert developmental psychologist, is that what you're trained in that, I think? Pre and perinatal pre -pre psycho psychology and psychotherapy. Pre and perinatal psychology and psychotherapy. So I am so excited to have her here today and we're going to talk a little bit about um, bonding and movement and what movement does to help trauma and how, how we can repair our nervous systems. So, okay, thank you, Sheriona. Thank you, Susan. And Sheriona, I know we, we could talk for hours because you have so much incredible expertise. But what we're going to talk with you today about is the importance of safety for bonding and how you do that with your movement therapy. Mm. Wow. Well, such an important topic, safety and bonding and attachment. And to me, it's hard to do any kind of therapy without including the body and ideally movement. Um, as my dear teacher, mentor, Emily Conrad, the founder of Continuum Movement, would say, movement isn't something we do, it's something we are. So there's always movement happening. And even when somebody's frozen due to trauma, um, there's still movement. We're still breathing at least a little bit, and that's movement. Our heart is still beating, hopefully. <laughs> if we're alive, our heart is beating, um, even if it's not a healthy rhythm, and that's movement. And those of us who are craniosacral therapists are very familiar with, you know, there are always subtle rhythms going on, and that's movement. So, but what can happen in, in trauma is um, that people freeze. Right? Their movement becomes uh, more based on defense than on a sense of safety and being able to socially interact. So we're, we're here at our workshop with Stephen Porges, who is the one who came up with the whole idea of the social engagement system, and that, <coughs> excuse me, our auto autonomic or automatic nervous system isn't just about sympathetic fight flight and parasympathetic rest, rejuvenation, or freeze, um, but that it includes a very important aspect that he calls the social engagement system. And, um, that in order to socially engage, we need to have some sense of safety. And if we can wake up that social engagement system, we're more likely to sense safety. So, and people um, who have had severe trauma, uh, often they're left in these more defensive states of the sympathetic fight flight, um, which needs to be moving. Uh, it's, it's, a lot about hyperactivity. Uh, it, it's designed to run away from the saber-toothed tiger um, or you know, whatever may be chasing us, but we're designed like the antelope you know, getting away from the lion. Once it's gotten away, then it shakes it out and goes back to grazing and finds its, its herd and goes back to normal life. Um, but if it's caught by the lion, or caught by the saber-toothed tiger, then um, nature has very kindly uh, designed us so that we stop moving, we immobilize. And as, as Stephen Poitras would say, we immobilize with fear rather than with a sense of safety, which is what's needed for social interaction. So if we immobilize with fear and, and play dead, as it's called, or feigning death, the, the lion or the saber-toothed tiger goes, oh, I didn't want dead meat, that might be rotten, and leaves us behind. Once it's gone, assuming we've survived that, we've managed to survive it because we haven't felt the pain, because we've frozen, we've dissociated, we, we stopped moving, and our tone went away, and we weren't feeling anything. So that, that's why it's, it's a kindness on the part of nature. We don't have to feel that pain. But we're designed, once the saber-toothed tiger leaves, to start moving and to shake it out 
I go, oh, I'm free, <laughs> I survived, yay. And we shake out that sympathetic um, surge that came first when we tried to run away and then we couldn't. So what happens in our modern world is we are overstimulated all the time, like by electronics, for example, that are helping us in this very moment to do this video. But they're everywhere, you know, iPhones, and um, there's, uh, there's noise everywhere. We're in the city right now. I can hear the traffic when I pay attention to it. And you know, people coming along, people. somebody walking over there. It's kindly, I think it's gone the other direction. That was social interaction in a way. That was on great. Their part, they mm -hmm. Very sweet. Yeah. Um, Very thoughtful. But, but people in the city don't necessarily socially interact with you. So you're just being bombarded constantly by stimuli and the system is um, going to be responding to it. So if the reason I'm going into this, all this, is that if we have a trauma history where the trauma hasn't been resolved, we're still going to be responding from either that fight flight place or that place of um, freezing, dissociating, low tone, immobilization, collapse. When we're in that place of collapse, we can't do anything. <laughs> this is very familiar to me. I spent the first 20 years of my life like this. I didn't have a neck. You can't see my neck right now. But and you I talked about how you cut off your neck. Is that right? You gave that movement of being cut off when you were young. Is it, was that being cut off your head from your body? Oh, right, yeah, I lived from my head up, mm. from mm. my neck up. So you totally. came from a traumatized childhood, did yeah, you? Definitely yeah, definitely from conception. And I know you've done a lot of work on your own, you know, birth history, etc. of course. It's You're true. working with Ray Castellino, like me, yeah. So that's what's yeah. enabled me to be able to, to mobilize. You yeah. can see I'm not actually in collapse. I hope you can see that. And actually, you're being so expressive. I wish that I could get my video bigger, but I just want <laughs> that you know the viewers to know that all your movements are being super expressive. Mm. Yeah, being so. contained. Yeah, you're being <laughs> contained. And is this part of your continuum training? Yeah. Oh, this is so continuum to me was kind of a continuum for my own healing. Mm. Uh, that was getting more and more subtle. I, I did other. I did breath work and movement work um, mm -hmm. as part of that and, and really working with my very early history, earlier and earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. And as I cleared things, things got more and more subtle and, and then I came to Emily Conrad and Continuum. And Continuum to me is such a profound practice for um, mobilizing, and in fact for any kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. It clearly is useful when people are in a fight-flight state because it helps us slow down. But for people who are in, have a tendency to immobilize, it helps us to start paying attention to the smallest little movements. I don't know if you can see my fingers moving right now. So we work a lot, continue with micro movements. And it's really, to me, it's a mindful movement practice. It's really a lot about listening. So as I move my fingers with these little intentional micro movements, because I do a lot of this, I pay attention, I'm trained to pay attention, like in any mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. I can feel responses, like there's a response in here, there's a response in here. And so I, I have mobilization happening. So this is what we can encourage people at home to do then, as yeah. they're watching you, is start yeah. to move their fingers a little bit. And yes, absolutely, feel. tiny little mm -hmm. movements. I did this with my mother when she was in her late 70s and having a bit of dementia already. And she's complaining of pain in her fingers. And it's like, well, what if you just move your fingers, tiny little movements? And that was really challenging for her. To, normally she would make very big, gross movements. She wasn't very connected with her body. But she was interested. She made these little tiny movements. And after about a minute, she said, I don't have pain anymore. That was amazing. Wow. That's huge. And you were asking me, since I'm speaking about my mother, mm -hmm. and you were asking about movement and bonding, I'd like to tell you the story of me and my mother. I'd, we'd love to know. <laughs> She's quite <laughs> profound. Oh. Um, she passed away three years ago. So I, 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 she's still here. Yeah, she's uh, here right now. Touched. Yeah, this is in honor of your mother then, in terms of bonding and safety yeah. and what you've been through and why you're so good at what you do. 
because you've lived it and you've moved, you're moving yeah, through it. Thank yeah. you. It's true. Yeah. So I, my take on things is that my mother and I took 50 years to bond because <laughs> <laughs> she had general anesthesia when mm -hmm. I was being born. Were, you, were you born in Canada? Yeah. In BC? No, in Ontario. Ontario, yeah. okay. So um, when my brother was born three years old, earlier, my mother had been working as, she was still working as a nurse when I was born, but she was a nurse for um, an OBGYN. She attended birth, she knew about birth. Mm -hmm. She's very close to the doctor who delivered him. And miraculously, 1952, he didn't have, they didn't have anesthesia. And they wow. were very bonded, mm -hmm. as was clear. Mm -hmm. When yeah. I came along, we, they had moved to another town. She didn't know the doctor and was a GP. I don't think he was as well trained with birth. Mm -hmm. And it was a little more into the 50s, I guess. Anesthesia was more in vogue, probably. And um, my mother says they gave her a little whiff of something just towards the end. Ether, probably. Was it Ether? Probably, yeah, yeah. Sounds like it. But mm -hmm. my experience is that it was near the beginning and she felt it was near the end because she wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, I had the same. Yeah, so yeah. you can relate. Yeah, absolutely. So there I am, low-tone little baby coming out. It took me almost two years to start walking. I never crawled. These days they call me developmentally delayed. Yeah. Um, you know, I think in part because of the anesthesia, how it affected me. But it profoundly, in my experience, it profoundly affected our relationship. And um, she really wasn't there. And I could go into a lot of detail about that, but... Yeah, I, just, I, I want to get your whole story on video. But, yeah, so, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll skip We'll to, do another one, we have a longer video. Okay. <laughs> we'll catch I'll up with the missing to, pieces. I'll skip to some years later, many mm -hmm. years later, when I was doing work with William Emerson and Ray Castellino mm -hmm. to learn about and heal my own. Mm -hmm. pre and perinatal yeah. uh, wounding mm -hmm. and um, I realized I, I had an interaction with my mother actually so I had done the work with I had done quite a bit of work with them and um, my mother and I were going to a family reunion and on the way there my mother was talking about it was her, her sister's family and her sister's family were always dancing and singing and we knew there would be dancing at the party. And my mother said, well, I'm not going to dance. And she made a comment that she had not danced since before I was born because my father didn't like to dance. And something in me just went, ah, you know, I'm a dance movement therapist. That's what brought me back to life. And I, my, it's natural for me to move. It's natural for any baby to, to move. But that's one of, I, I'm a kinesthetic movement kind of person. And I realized my mother never met me there. She never danced. She was so dissociative, she wasn't in her body. And so there we are at the party. <laughs> and um, I went out of the room for a while and I came back in and there was my mother and her sister dancing. And they were just holding hands, kind of swaying back and forth. And I was like, oh my God, my mother's dancing. So I waited till they were finished and I took my, her sister's place. And I held my mother's hands and gazed into her eyes as we rocked back and forth. And I was just sobbing the whole time because to me, it was a totally conscious thing. This is what I needed. Every baby needs to be held with eye contact, rocking, held close to a mother who's present with them and moving with them. And, and I never had that. And yeah. you never had that. Yeah. And there's Dr. Porges today talking about rocking and the importance and dancing together. Yeah, and how we, we neurologically feel safer when yeah. we have eye contact. If you talk to your therapist and they turn away, you, you don't feel safe and you can't talk. So, wow. Yeah. When, how long ago was that? So I was 50. You were 50. So, yeah, it took 50 years. 50 years. <laughs> Must have been huge for your mother, too. It was. It was very profound for both of us. And of course, you know, I was crying, so she was crying, too. <laughs> so I say that because there's hope for all of us. Yes. And the power of movement and bonding. We'd never had that. And I felt like we'd never bonded. You know, I'd never felt close to my mother. My mother used to complain that I 
oh, when we talked about it later, she complained. She she reported. My mother wasn't the complaining type, but she reported that she felt like I pushed her away. Yeah, and, and she would never have known why you two weren't connected, and I it's didn't heartbreaking. Know no, no. So, so, what would you, in terms of that, then, what would you recommend? You know, given your own history and how healing that's been, would you recommend that everybody takes up dance? <laughs> well, I don't know Do that you, dance is for everybody. Yeah, no. Movement is for everybody. Movement. You know, if you feel attracted to dancing, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's five minutes a day. And I was inspired by Gabriel Roth recently, mm -hmm. who developed five rhythms yes. movement work. Yes. And she talks about in, in her book how her movement practices, she has a practice every day to put on some music and just dance. You know, that it's important to let your body respond. Yes. But some people don't feel comfortable with dancing, but we're always moving. So, you know, if it's a matter of doing this every day, do this. You know? Or maybe it's more like this. Or maybe something that's really helpful for mobilizing is to be able to push against something. So, um, I'm going to get you push go back to the, the floor here. Okay, there's a good floor. Can, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can push against the wall or push against another person where you, you can meet each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that can really help a person to feel their body. You can also push against yourself. So the pushing is really important to help you feel your body. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of that co-regulation, co if you do it with somebody else, then it enhances everything. Yeah. So these are things that you're suggesting that people can do every day. They're simple things to do. And you went off, I think yesterday you were off to do some, dra were you going to do some dragon exercise? What were you going to do yesterday? So I'm going to do a brief exercise yourself. Do you remember that? <laughs> what, what would you do for yourself like today? We've been in, you've been in eight days. This is our 10th day. Well, I've been it? doing continuum. Yeah, and so. so we're sitting in these little yeah. tiny seats. I know. And I'm sitting there kind of doing this. So you're doing your and waves the seat. go through my body. Mm -hmm because otherwise it all densifies, it gets dense yeah. and stiff, and I get miserable. <laughs> I yeah. don't like to be that way. No. So I keep myself moving, and whenever I have a free moment, I go hide somewhere, and I do some bigger movement. Can we you see know, some or, bigger movements? Because um, <laughs> is this OK? Uh, to, is sure. it, as a demo, because it's fantastic, because what you're showing us is what we can do when we're stuck in a chair. Right. You can still move inside, right. and, you're doing, and you can do the little micro movements. And then when you can escape, like I'm taking up, you know, time in our valuable lunch break. So if I wasn't videoing you, what kind of movements would you be doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I notice my neck gets stiff, so I do a lot stiff? of just allowing it to stretch. Mm -hmm. In Continuum, we make sounds like, simple sounds, like an E sound, like the letter E mm -hmm. helps to spread things, widen things. You can put that your hands sense. somewhere if you have, mm -hmm. just if you want to breathe more, if you have mm -hmm. tension, or you have pain somewhere. And listen to how your body responds. I do a lot of this, so my body's quite fluid and it naturally goes into these kinds of waves. Can you see with my scarf on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it seems like the sound is important too. I did Continuum a long time ago, mm. but um, yeah, I know people who do it in you, and it's like, yeah, it just feels very freeing and liberating, and it's that mobilization which we all need to do a lot more of. Yeah. Sharon, I, I want to, what? I call it Continue Yum. Continue Yum. So this is very Continue Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm thinking, maybe we could do another video at another point when we do like like you more you know at a you know la a larger video for example That'd be lovely. that would be really yeah, fun we can continue we will continue this yummy conversation okay, thank well, you so much for giving people a sense of what they can do to work with trauma especially early infant trauma and um, what happened with you bonding with your mother that's so touching and inspiring I bet everyone okay. wants to go and dance with their mother <laughs> I highly <laughs> recommend it yes. if it's possible yes so that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.
meridianholistichealth.com